Welcome back to the Valley to Peak Nutrition Podcast. This week, I'm joined by Rowan Smith. Rowan owns a business called Summit Strength, whose sole purpose is training people for big mountain adventures. I've known Rowan for a while. We started as acquaintances, and slowly our relationships evolved over the last five years to being colleagues, where I do a lot of consulting for the folks that he works with on some of the more advanced topics in the world of nutrition as they prepare for big mountain trips. Eventually, I reached out to Rowan, not knowing what I don't know. So he and I worked together for about 20 weeks as I trained for the Alaskan death hike this year. The topic that Rowan and I look at this week is very timely for most folks as we're starting to get into late August, early September. We talk about deloading, which in more simplistic terminology is basically just how do you back off of exercise to make sure that your muscles are rested right before a big trip into the mountains so that you can perform optimally when you take that first step on the trail. I'll link Rowan contact information in the show notes so you can get a hold of him if you're interested and stick around for a couple of minutes after the show is over to get some details on a giveaway that we're launching throughout September into October and it's really the only giveaway that we do all year there's a ton of I think it's a ton of fun uh, and the best part is it's open to anybody and an easy way to get your hand on some cool prizes which is predominantly really really cool gear so without further ado here's Rowan Smith from Summit Strength on running a proper deload before you're season starts all right welcome back to the valley to peak nutrition podcast i am joined by rowan of summit strength again this week rowan and i today are going to talk a little bit um about deload and really we're going to pick his brain as the expert rowan appreciate you coming back on the podcast how are you today oh my absolute pleasure mate my absolute pleasure always 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 love hopping on these things and, and having a chat so so yeah thanks for having me on board and and i'm feeling uh feeling pretty good this morning just had a big coffee so i'm uh, i'm ready to roll yeah it's uh because you're in you said that you were a little bit north of of sydney now you guys are kind of in a mountain town preparing for a wedding yeah so we're we're up uh six hours north of sydney we're in uh this this cool town that's like half country half hippie so it's this uh this <laughs> nice mix of uh super chilled vibes and beautiful area and uh and yeah so so we're getting married up here in a couple of months so we're just chilling out for the weekend and doing a bit of prep for that cool so as we sort of jump into this topic of course i just hit like before we even hit record we were talking about like my peak week and can you talk us a little bit about the general overview of the weeks leading up to a deload, kind of what that progression looks like from starting relatively low and building a base like we talked about in um, in the first episode or in part one to steadily climbing up to what a term that most people are familiar with is peak week. Can you kind of define what that increase looks like and what peak week quote unquote really is yeah absolutely so so i guess if you're looking at like you know a, a, a training journey and it's never as simple as this because life comes up but if we're just looking like you know as a, as a general training journey if you're tracking your sort of the difficulty and the intensity and the amount of training you're kind of doing from the start that you absolutely start a training to all the way off that uh that you head off on your actual trip it kind of will look on a graph like it'll be a nice slow start steady build and be a slowly 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 rising and as you get closer and closer to the trip that sort of you know intensity the difficulty the amount of training you do sort of ramps up ramps up and you know gets a little bit steeper if you're tracking on a graph so it gets harder 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 with the intention of probably about you know three weeks before you head away on a big trip is typically you know where you'd be wanting to be having your hardest week of training so in regards to doing your toughest training hikes you know your heaviest pack weight you know your your biggest strength sessions all, all of that stuff really sort of culminating in, in this one final week of big hard effort and that'll be sort of the highest level of work that you do before you go away and then from there once you've got hit that sort of peak where you're like you know what i've flogged myself i've pushed it i've hit these numbers i'm feeling really good then we just want to give the body a little bit of time to chill out before it heads off so you can recover you can adapt because as well as we always say uh you know the body doesn't get stronger fitter more resilient from training but it gets stronger more resilient um when we recover from training so we need to give the body plenty of time for that before you head off so kind of this peak week is sort of three weeks before you head off absolutely push it and then from there we just sort of take the foot off the accelerator chill out before you head off and just help the body have enough time to, to recover relax and, and feel good for the trip so as a really really big overview that's kind of what we look at nice slow build with the intention of really culminating three weeks out before you go and then then chilling out from there 
And then obviously other things come up, you know, life gets in the way. We may have like um, holidays that get, you know, stuck in the, uh, stuck on right on that third week, uh, three weeks before you go, we might get sick or whatever it may be. All these different things come up, but as a general overview, that's kind of what we're, what we're looking for. And, and on that, on that peak week, like, you know, as you, as you steadily build up and really start getting towards maximum efforts is, is the volume and maybe the, the weight someone is carrying in their pack is that based on a percentage of their total body weight or are you kind of as the coach, are you adjusting those levels based on, um, based on their performance at the lower level? So like, for example, if, if a person doesn't increase by a certain degree of body weight, or if you write the prescription for some sort of a training session and they don't do well on that, is that then adjusted accordingly as opposed to just going with a linear percent of their body weight does that make sense yeah yeah absolutely and and you can really go kind of either either direction here now i know a lot of people do like the sort of yeah the percentage of the body weights they like the numbers they like the metrics and they kind of do the planning around that and it does work and i guess it kind of works when you're a little bit more hands-off on the coaching experience. Maybe you've been, you know, got a, a program which you don't really have a coach attached. Maybe there's just working with lots and lots of numbers or whatever. That stuff does work. I, I won't sort of disparage that. But basically the way that I do it is, you know, I'm a little bit more hands-on. So, you know, it's more towards that that situation where we are adjusting as we go and as necessary. So the way I kind of look at things in the initial stages of programming is we'll sort of work backwards from the end goal and we'll sort of say, okay, before they head off, you know, in this sort of peak week, we kind of want to be hitting certain numbers. We will either want to be hitting a certain amount of time on the trail. We either want to be hitting a certain amount of pack weight, uh, maybe a certain amount of mileage, kilometers or, or whatever it may be. There's certain things we kind of want to hit there. And then I'll sort of sit down and go, all right, roughly working back from this, you know, what are the sort of months leading to that going to kind of look like? And that's our sort of first iteration of everything. But then, as you sort of mentioned before, as we go through, you know, in perfect world, people would start low pack weight, pass spark, start low mileage, just build it, 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 hit that peak week as we wanted with those metrics and, and away you go. But there will be periods where most people will have things that come up. So as you said, maybe they don't respond so well to a particular pack weight. Um, maybe they get sick. Maybe a session doesn't go so well. Maybe they get a niggle and we're like, oh, we need to manage that load or whatever it may be. So for the way that I go about things typically is, you know, we have a little bit more adjustments in that situation. So we may sort of say, okay, we need to extend this pack weight out before progressing. We might need to do the same pack weight on our hikes for a few weeks, or we may need to just take a couple of weeks, just purely off walking or whatever, and all those little adjustments. And that'll change the the ongoing plan where we have to, you know, still get you to those metrics before you head off. But then it just takes a little bit of a, a different approach. So a bit of a convoluted way of saying, but um, but yeah, kind of the way I look at it is, yeah, we sort of adjust as we go because, you know, training is never really a linear process. The thing has always come up. So we kind of need to think on our feet in those situations. And, and for someone who, you know, has been pushing through peak week, they're feeling fatigued, maybe even feeling some twinges. I don't want to call it pain because obviously like, you don't want to necessarily push through any pain that's going to cause a bigger issue, I would guess. But is it if you're feeling the general fatigue of the training, is it better to push through that and get the volume? Or as as the coach, do you kind of say and recognize that and say, okay, you know, let's back off because of what the body's how the body's responding? Or what what suggestion do you have that as someone hits peak week if they're feeling pretty, pretty fatigued? Yeah, so it's a it's an interesting one because because kind of the lens you may look at it is you know three weeks out when we're hitting this peak week, this is kind of yeah the last big push we're going to be doing with our training. This is sort of the last big attempt to try to hit that mileage or those distance and and get us feeling not only physically ready for that but also mentally that can help a lot to be able to tick these numbers off before you go. But on the other side of things, as you said, you know, coming into this week, you know, you, a lot of people can be carrying a lot of fatigue because they've already been, it's not like peak week is just one week. You know, usually your training's ramping up in the weeks before you are ramping up the mileage, ramping up the intensity. So it does get a little bit tricky and a lot of people are carrying fatigue into that. So it's really kind of a case by case basis in this particular situation. I would usually sort of, you know, sort of say to someone, look, if you're really struggling with a lot of fatigue um, during this week, it's kind of like pick your battles. 
in the sense of you may have, you know, your training program, you may sort of have, okay, in my, this week, I might be doing a couple of strength sessions. I might have a big hike. I might be doing a heel interval or a stair interval or something like that. You may have a full training week ahead and in the perfect world, you would be pushing all of those sessions and really, really giving a good, good, uh, good red hot crack to, to really push it. But if you are entering the, in a fatigue state, I will kind of say, pick your battles, choose couple just to go chill on and maybe say look you know these are going to be a lot much easier i'm going to conserve my energy and then maybe choose one or two which are the priorities which you're going to go and make happen and in this situation for a peak week it's always priorities always going to be your hike if you are getting out for a hike that week and getting that mileage and even if in that week you don't do any other hard sessions and you're like the strength's easy i've like taken away weight there maybe the hill intervals and i've just done that on the flat maybe the you know anything else is really really easy but you still can push yourself on that hike i think that's still a big win for peak week in itself so i would say if you are coming in fatigued try to still get the hike in if possible but then maybe reduce other areas and then on top of that the final thing i'd sort of say to that is if you do have this hike coming up and you're like you know what wake up in the morning i'm flat i'm struggling i don't have much in me then have some contingency plans ready. So maybe choose a hike where you do have a couple of bailout points. So if you get halfway and you're like, I am cooked, you can step off. And it's, yeah, maybe a bit disappointing, but if you're absolutely fatigued, absolutely flat, you know, it may be going backwards if you're, you know, just trying to push it for another 10 kilometers or whatever. So maybe choose something with a bailout point. And then also number two is if you are doing um, a loader pack and you've got a reasonable amount of weight in this week, um, what you can do is, you know, do a reasonable portion of your pack weight in water bottles or a dry bag full of water. And then if you do, again, hit that point, like I'm fried, I tried, I pushed it, I gave my best, but I'm absolutely fried. Then pour a lot of that water out, take the stress off you, finish off the hike, but take that intensity away. So yeah, I would sort of say pick your battles and then have contingency plans in place. So you can get as much benefit out of this week, but you're not obviously running yourself into the ground. So is, is, is part of like, you know, someone's planning a a pretty, a pretty big endurance type of a hike, a lot of miles is part of the strategy of planning. Like, so for our, our volume, some of the, the highest amount was eight to nine hours is part of the strategy for that. You're not only trying to train your body to carry a pack for that long. You're not only trying to accomplish a a, a couple of, of, of important pieces whenever it comes to improving the performance on the trail, is a part of that simply just getting your body used to being on its feet that long? Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and both body and mind in the sense that, you know, one of the biggest, particularly when we're talking about these insurance hikes or these big mileage things, you know, we can do all the training in the world. We can get you super, super strong. We can get you, you know, smash you on the hill in the balls. We can, you know, do some great, great stuff on like a sled or, or, you know, or whatever. We can get you really, really strong, fit and resilient and in a really, really good spot. But the only thing we can't really replicate in the gym and we can help with it, but we can't actually replicate it. It's just that feeling of being on our feet for so long and moving. And that doesn't matter. That doesn't, you know, make a major difference if we're doing that with just wandering around or whether we're carrying a pack. But it's really, really hard to fill that gap um, between, you know, smashing into the gym and feeling really, really good and and getting that time on your feet and just being, you know, used to moving for eight or nine hours, whatever it may be. And obviously in your context, you know, you've got many, many more hours you're going to be on your feet and we're never going to get you up to, you know, doing 48 hour training hikes. It's not going to happen. Um but yeah, just try to fill that gap as much as we can and get as many hours on the feet as possible. Um, that can go a long way, you know, regardless of strength and fitness or whatever it may be. Um, but then on top of that, you know, on the mental side of things, again, is just getting the body and the mind used to walking for so long. Um, because for people who may not have done that, um, it may be causing quite a bit of nerves. Um, people may be stressing out that actually I haven't really done a huge amount of walking with that pack weight for a certain amount of time. Um, or maybe people are like, you know, they've never experienced that like weirdness that goes on your head when you get past the six, seven hour mark. And, you know, we all, we've all been there. We've done it. Um, but, you know, the mental games start playing on. And again, you know, eight hours, it's it's not going to be the same as 48 hours, but we live in the real world. We've got to fit in what we can, but, but that's kind of, yeah, uh, a big portion of it as well. So, and I don't want to be, if I'm being redundant, tell me. Um, it, it, so you hit on it just a second ago. There's obviously no way to duplicate 
60 miles, 29,000 feet of vertical up and 29,000 vertical feet of down and beyond just doing it. When you're training for something like that, is the idea that you're trying to get, you know, 50% of what your planned max hike statistics are, or is there a certain metric? Am I overthinking that? Yeah, so so there definitely is um, certain metrics that a lot of people will strive for with this type of thing. And a lot of people advocate, okay, yeah, we do want to hit 50% of a mileage or we do want to hit 75% of a mileage, depending on the kind of, you know, the, the, the length of what you're doing. Um, and that can work. And a lot of people advocate for it. But the lens I kind of view from this is that can work, but really in the situation where training is the only really thing that going into your life in all honesty, like <laughs> it works for a lot of people, but you know, I, I know so many other people have things that are going on families work, this and that, and this and that. So the way that I kind of look at it is okay. Looking through the lens of what is the most amount of distance we can do before you go. That's going to be realistic to fit into someone's life. And that's not going to put, you know, uh, strains on the relationship that's not going to put you know your extra stress on work or this and that so it's not quite as technical as having a particular metric because yeah you know hitting 50 percent, 75 percent, depending on the hike um hike length that is reasonable to go for the way i look at it is like i was looking at your program and i was like ah you know what his wife would probably kill him if he's out hiking for 14 hours like i don't, <laughs> don't think that's pretty reasonable so i was like you know what eight to nine hours or seven or eight hours or whatever we did i was like look that's a full day's worth of hiking that's enough to get us a good, good training response. But, you know, from my context, I was like, that's probably more reasonable for your situation. And and if we, you know, if we sort of sat down and we had a conversation, you were like, you know what, I could probably go out and do a 12-hour hike without too much issues. Maybe we may have done that. But in all honesty, you know, I think what we did hitting that eight hours is probably enough um, for, for what you need. And I think you're in a good spot for, for where you're going anyway. So yeah, not quite as a technical lens that I take on that, on that side of things, but it's more of what's the maximum realistic that's going to fit into your life without detracting from other areas and then work backwards from there. Yeah. I, I love that. I mean, that's what we constantly talk about in, in this program too, is it's like, yeah, sure. There's a hundred different optimal recommendations when it comes to nutrition, but you've got to find what's practical. And we did have that conversation and, you know, with a newborn, a three-year-old who probably demands as much, if not more attention than the newborn, he's relatively easy. He's just, he's just lively. And then my wife, we've got no family in town. I won't, I won't like pitch a sob story, but it would have been really tough to find the time to squeeze in many more hours than I did. And you highlighted this a little bit ago. I don't think that you can anticipate or duplicate the mental piece of just being on your feet and moving for seven, eight plus hours. And, you know, like I know specifically the strategy going into the hike with the group that I'm going with is, you know, we'll do a couple of hours and then we'll, we'll take a break for 30 minutes, rest the feet, roll, roll stuff out, you know, roll our calves out or whatever, grab something to eat and, and move again for two hours, rinse and repeat the entire time. So I won't be on my feet necessarily seven hours in a single stretch, but at the same time, like I wanted, I wanted to do that to accustom me, to accustom myself with that mental challenge because I don't, I don't think you can duplicate it beyond just doing it. Yeah, absolutely. And and on that point, actually, there's a so yeah, absolutely duplicating it very, very, very tricky. Um, one one thing that it's a, it's an interesting topic, and and um, one cool thing that a lot of people do, and and in this situation, this is coming out of sort of the mountaineering world where. You know, people will have summit days that will literally go from 20 hours to, you know, 30 hours of movement at 7,000, 6,000 metres above sea level in the snow. <laughs> like, you know, these crazy things that you're never, ever, ever in the world going to be able to replicate that type of thing. Like, it's impossible. But one of the sort of uh, strategies that some people use in this world, and this isn't my strategy, I've sort of gotten this from a guy called Joe Bonington, who's an awesome strength conditioning coach for mountaineers um, over in Australia. Um, but basically what he does with some of his athletes is something called a grind session, which basically involves finding something that's really, 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 really boring and really, 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 really 
um, repetitive and something that's even uncomfortable um, and just doing that for a long, long, long period of time. So the one he often talks about is, you know, we live in Northern Beaches of Sydney. Like we, we live like five kilometres from each other. It's crazy. Like we're the only people, <laughs> only a few people in Australia do what we do and we live right next to each other. But anyway, um, but he goes down to, you know, with his be- uh, to the beach with his clients. He'll set up a sled harness with a tyre and then he'll sort of say, okay, you know, to replicate this 20-hour summit day, you're going to spend eight hours going up and down this beach with your tyre. And the difference between that and actually being out on the trail is it's terribly boring. It's like the harness, the tire, getting caught in the sand. It's really, really, you know, frustrating and uncomfortable. But he kind of uses things like that to kind of almost replicate the mental battle of that type of thing. So, you know, if someone is going into something like this and they're like, well, you know what, you know, there's no way I can replicate the miles, but maybe I am a little bit worried about the mental battle of something like that. You can kind of look and, you know, maybe including a grind session or two where you just choose something really, really repetitive, really, really boring, and just go out and do that for a long period of time. It's not super technical, but, you know, when we're looking through that mental battle, it can be effective. So, uh, so yeah, I thought that would be an interesting point to, to throw in. Yeah, and anybody who's spent any marginal amount of time in a tire sled <laughs> knows how <laughs> miserable in such a grind session that's truly got to be. What about like the day, you know, let's just say like the week or maybe even four to five days leading up to actual departure day and and you go out on the trip. Do you suggest doing base, you know, doing absolutely nothing in the days leading up to the trip start? Do you suggest a lower volume of what you've always been doing? What do you generally suggest whenever it comes to, you know, a couple of days before the trip? So when we're looking just like a couple of days, so anywhere from like three to seven days before the trip, typically in in that period, what I usually recommend is, you know, we don't want to be doing full training sessions. You know, this is recovery time. This is chill out time. This is just helping the body settle and make sure any energy is, you know, up there by the time we hit it. Um, But we also don't want to be doing nothing. Um, Not in the sense that you know, doing a small amount is going to help improve our fitness or anything like that. You know, that's done with. We've already done everything we can for our fitness and our strength. But really where this small amount of movement comes into really, really, really important is number one, just keeping the body moving in regards to, you know, making sure aches and pains don't creep up or maybe start getting a little bit stiff and this and that. Because we know, you know, when we've been training for quite a while, we have a week off. You know, we haven't been moving as much. You know, the body sometimes does get a little bit sore, a little bit tight, a little bit achy. And in everyday life, that's not a big deal at all. But before a trip, when you're already like hypersensitive to everything going on in your body, if you feel an ache and you're like, oh my gosh, my knee sore, (laughs) that's going to freak you out before your trip and you don't want that. So it's really looking through that of saying, okay, we're just going to minimize the risk of that, you know, that creeping up. So it can help settle that. Number two, um, you know, as I sort of said before, you know, leading into these trips, there is so much stress. Um, there's pre-trip nerves, there's finishing up your work, there's, um, you know, feeling, you know, preparing things with your family, there's, um, you know, organizing all the last minute bits and pieces. All of these are things that are adding to a really, really stressful experience. Um, and just doing a little bit of work, a little bit of training can help mitigate that a little bit and just give you some an outlet to, you know, we know training can be good for, for stress. So that can be a really, really important thing. Um, and then finally, like if there are, and I do have a lot of clients who fall into this uh, category, a lot of people will get to this end of the week and they will feel there might have been something missing in their prep in regards to maybe they got sick three or four weeks out. Maybe they had to go on a holiday or whatever it may be. And, and maybe there's something that they're just a little bit worried about. And for a lot of people that ends up being pack weight and they're like, oh, you know what? Maybe I didn't get enough time training with my pack. Maybe I didn't get used to carrying this full weight or whatever it may be. So during this time, a really simple um, thing that I get a lot of my clients to do is just look to do 15 to 30 minute sessions, full pack weight of what you're expecting on your trip, plus maybe a kilo or two just to overload a little bit and literally just do a a lap or two around the neighborhood block, 15, 30 minutes, do that every couple of days. And that can be a really nice way of, you know, just keeping the body moving, but also mentally just going, oh, you know what, this pack weight isn't so bad. So that can be really effective for people who haven't, may not have had such a smooth process leading up to, to, to their trip departure. 
All right. So Rowan, before we sign off, any other tips that you'd suggest leading into, you know, peak week, deloading before a big trip, training, tra training in general on this front, any last minute suggestions that we haven't covered that, that you'd, you'd pass along? Yeah. So one really, really, really important point on top of all this. So kind of, as I sort of said before, um, when we're looking at this type of peak week and these final weeks, there are so many stresses going on in the body. You know, as I sort of said, there's stress with work, there's stress with pre-trip nerves, there's stress with last minute organization. There's a stress from peak week when you've really pushed yourself and really got to the point. And one thing that happens to so, 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 so many people in their deload week is as soon as they take their foot off the pedal of the training and they're like, ah, oh, you know what, I can relax, they get sick. And it happens to so many people just because there's so many factors in there. And obviously getting sick just before your trip, it can add more nerves, more stress, more whatever. So it's something we want to sort of mitigate as much as we can. So it's really a case of, okay, yeah, you're looking at your training and everything, but, you know, other things we need to put a bit of focus into. So sleep, you know, making sure we are still getting a reasonable amount of sleep. We're not staying up late doing last minute organization. We're not staying up late saying if we're going on a really you know, extended trip, you know, having goodbyes or social occasions or whatever, set yourself a bedtime and really try to stick with it and protect your sleep. You know, with your nutrition, like obviously this is your your field, but one thing I see in a practical sense of this type of stuff is a lot of people will just run out of time and they'll just go, they'll be eating really, really well and lead up and last couple of weeks, they're like, I don't have time. I don't want to buy groceries, this and that. So they end up just throwing all their good eating practices out the window, just getting takeout as convenience or whatever it may be. And again, you know, maybe they're not getting that nutritional component to help sustain them, you know, during this time and, and that can be an impact. So pre-planning a bit of nutrition, making it easy for yourself, staying on top of that, stay on top of your hydration, maybe look at some stress management, but do whatever you can during this time, just not to get sick because it's such a common thing. So a big spanner in the works. And the last thing in the world you want is being on one of these trips and having a head cold and just be like, you know what, I just want to be home. So on top of all that, you know, make sure you are considering that because it is a big factor. And I see it again and again and again again just all that pre-trip stress um it really does uh you know impact a lot of people yeah it's such a good suggestion like we talk about this even among our program with with our clients like we call it buckets right so it's inevitable to not have any stress training itself can cause the body stress and uh, you know worry lack of sleep all the things that you had already named it's like really it's not a matter of trying to avoid all stress that's probably impossible but it is reasonable expectation to control the stress as much as you can so that your bucket's not overflowing. Because like you said, it's inevitable that if that bucket does overflow, all the precipitate that comes out of that is just going to lead to something negative that you don't want. And you've worked way too hard to this point to let something like that happen. Well, I sure appreciate you joining us, Rowan. It's really insightful on the deload thing. I mean... I've heard, obviously, you know, people are always talking about deloading before events. I've even suggested it to myself, but the, you know, the, the, the level of extra insight that you provided, I think will be super helpful in providing clarity for a lot of folks and, and me included. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. No, that's, um, no, that's really good to hear. And I really do hope people get some, some solid value out of this and, and it can make a bit of a difference because there's no, uh, there's no set in stone rules for this type of thing. It is a very, very individual thing, but hopefully some of those ideas I've passed along can um, help people uh, put it together themselves. People want to check you out or get a hold of you, ask you questions, see what programs that you offer. What's a good way for them to get a hold of you? Yeah, probably um, best place to come find me um, is if you are interested in learning a little bit more about sort of training and physical preparation for, you know, hiking, backpacking adventures. Um, come and find me on Facebook. Um, I run a free Facebook group called the Training for Hiking and Trekking Facebook group. Now, inside there, you know, I'm always happy to answer questions. If someone does have a taper coming up and they're like, what should I do? You know, come in there, post up. If anyone's interested in learning about certain exercises, workouts, um, or whatever, for particularly for training for hiking, um, you can come in there, ask away. I put up loads of free content. So, so, yeah, that's probably the best place to find me, the Training for Hiking and Trekking Facebook group. Perfect, Rome. Thanks again. My pleasure. 
Thanks for joining us this week. If you enjoyed this, take a couple of seconds, if you don't mind, to like it, leave us a comment, share it with a friend who might also uh, benefit from learning about the information in it or any of the topics that we've covered in the past. On that same topic, if there are things that you want to hear about, if you've got questions that you want to hear covered in one of the episodes, shoot those ideas over to info at v2pnutrition.com and we will definitely take note of them and put them on the agenda to chat through. I promised you more information about a giveaway that we're doing through throughout the rest of the fall. Uh, we are running our annual hashtag gummy in the wild contest. And if you've done that before, you're probably familiar with it. And if not, the rules are pretty simple. You just come up with the most creative picture that you can of your gummies in the wild. In the past, we've had folks submit full-on scenery where they've taken gummy bears almost like an action figure. Uh, we've had people uh, submit them with gummies using binoculars on the trip that they're on. Sometimes we've had folks submit some pretty inappropriate pictures. It's always fun to do, though, and uh, it's always fun to see the creative things that folks come up with. So... Entering is very simple. You take the picture, post it on social media. You can even email it to me if you want. I mean, if you want to enter and you're one of the um, arguably very wise folks who don't get on social media a lot, feel free to just shoot that over to me in an email and you know you can still take advantage of it. Tag it with hashtag gummy in the wild, G-U-M-M-Y in the wild. Win some free gear from Xped, who's got some awesome, um, geez, they've got all sorts of cool stuff from down booties to packs to tents to spectacular sleeping pads if you've never used one. Uh, we'll get some, uh, I, Gabriel over at Ivory Holsters has given away a holster to someone who I don't know that there's a better holster on the market uh, if you're if you carry in bear country or if you just carry in general, give away some stuff from XO Mountain Gear and Argali, who are two, uh, two, two companies that I love personally, and more importantly, both Idaho companies, both small companies, both local, and both have just uh, owners and folks working for them who are genuinely some of the, the kindest and best in the business. And new this year, I'm going to give away some backcountry cooking gear. Uh, so some stuff that I personally love from stoves and pots and a free copy of the DIY dehydrating guide that we made. So you can start out on that. If you're interested in entering, you can check out the post that I will link in the show notes as well. You've got a while to enter. And I will tell you this, not many people have entered this in the past. So your chances of winning are quite high, which is a lot different than... Um, which is a lot different than maybe other other entries that you've done before. If you're really anxious, want to grab your want to grab the DIY guide before then, you can find that on the website uh, for the end of October. It's literally less than the cost of one store bought dehydrated meal, so it pays for itself if you make one batch out of that that book. So. We'll be back again in a couple of weeks to recap the last part of the Exo Mountain Gear Death Hike, plus some additional bonus episodes with great content that you can actually use throughout the rest of the fall. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great week, everyone.